All hail King Bowser, Lord of Bowserland, Dark Land Overwatch, and Supreme Leader of the Third Order. This was it. This was Bowser's big moment. The entire kingdom had come, on his royal decree of course, to Castle Bowser to witness his latest plan for domination of the Mushroom Kingdom and all the lands on the planet Earth. He stepped up to his throne and sat down with a resounding thud, his tail curling around to give his butt room to sit. He needed to get that tail hole in his throne built. Ah, uh, if he just had a free weekend to get around to doing it. Oh well hear this he shouted, his voice gruff with bellows of determination. Bowser would not lose this time. He would dominate. We are doing to destroy the Mushroom Kingdom. There was no response other than a few coughs he continued. I mean... We're going to annex the Mushroom Kingdom and subjugate it like a second-class colony, stealing all its production capabilities for our own benefit. The entire castle was in an upracious cheer. The Goomba jumped up and down, and the bloopers floated around in a slightly more jovial manner than usual. Surely he would succeed this time, where all others he failed my loyal Lieutenant Mad Stein has unveiled a new formula a new weapon that will allow us to defeat the Mushroom Kingdom defense forces with little to no resistance. We shall be invincible. The crowd cheered again, with just as much uproar as before. Bowser explained this formula. It is a new type of nerve gas, synthesized from the swamps of the Forever Forest, deep as can be found. When exposed in its new, altered form, any organism coming into contact with it will be immediately transformed into a horseradish. There was masterful applause. This was Bowser's finest moment, indeed we will take all our greatest armies, storm through the dry dry desert, and delve right into our final territory. Princess Peach will be ours and so will the world. Then we'll march on to Sarazaland. We'll decimate Woluidai's island. Diamond City will fall. The Great Bobbly Tree, the Toad Highlands, Yoshi's Island, Luncheon Kingdom, the Neuron Jungle, Starborn Valley, the Star Carnival, Nimbus Land. It will all be ours. The cheers wouldn't stop. The people of Bowser's kingdom were as loyal as they were enthusiastic. But, but, but it wasn't real. For there was one aspect of all of this that Bowser had noticed that sent his feelings askew. And it was not something to take lightly in this. For there was a member of Bowser's legions that simply wasn't here. As always, his most prized subjects, the royal family, were here. His dad Kamek and his wife Kamela, his uncle Psycho Kamek, his seven children by his first wife the Koopalings, all standing at attention, his weird surrogate clones turned sons the Koopsa kids, and of course his precious youngest child and heir apparent to the throne Bowser Jr. They were his closest allies and stood by him no matter what. Then there were his greatest generals, the military leaders and vassal state governors that led Bowser's kingdom to greatness. General Shy Guy, King Kaylee Ent, Teuton Koopsa, Tubba Blubber, Foreman Spike, Rudy the Clown, Don Bongo, and all those darn brutals, even with King Goomba absent recovering from heart surgery last week. His array of leaders under his command was impressive by any measure. And his armies were as vast as could be, covering every inch of free space in his massive throne room and outside the castle. Literally millions of Goomba all stacked in giant piles of Goomba and more Goomba. The Hammer Bros core were in their dynamic pose and absolutely refusing to move until he was done with his speech. The Wiggler Squad consisting of hundreds of hot-tempered scouts that would make for an advance party before the main invasion, were assembled and ready. The shy guys were not here, as social situations with big crowds made them uncomfortable, but it was a guarantee that they would arrive when the time was right. He even saw some of the fun minibosses he had assembled over the years, like P.T. Piranha, Cloud N. Candy, Bossu Mogro, and even Lakey Thunder. That rascal. It would all be perfect, if it were real. But there was someone missing. Boom boom. So, without another word, he got up from his throne, stretched out the tail that had kind of been cramping, and left the throne room amidst all the cheers. They were still going by the time he closed the door behind him. Asterisk, there we was, bench pressing in the otherwise empty personal gym while watching a muted CRT playing KNN, Coops News Network.
It was, of course, showing live coverage of Bowser's speech and now showing two news anchors, Anderson Cooper and Mejin Koopy, discussing how great and wonderful the new plans to invade the Mushroom Kingdom were. Bowser enjoyed watching state-sponsored media, but it could be a little dry sometimes. Without speaking, Bowser picked up some dumbbells and started curling with both hands right next to Boom Boom, who was doing exercises with an inflatable ball at the same time as crunches with a bar. It was unwieldy but he seemed really into it, or at least really into the music he was listening to, it was Emotion by Carly Rae Jepsen. It was quiet, and it was nice. Bowser somehow felt relieved that he had realized that Boom Boom wasn't there. After all these years, he was his closest friend, the one who would stick by him when things were strong, and who would cower away the moment things got tough. It always helped Bowser stay focused in the moment, to know when the tide was turning against him, as it inevitably always did. He'd been there since the beginning. Since he overthrew Morton Koopsa and took over Dark Land. Since the first time he kidnapped Princess Peach. Since Bowser's very first elaborate underground castle that emerges to fly in the air for no practical reason. And, besides the part where he ran away halfway through every time, Boom Boom was an unstoppable ally. Despite the hardship, and the constant bashing of the head by a certain nameless plumber. Despite that late night drunken phone call to Pom Pom that very nearly ruined their friendship and made work really awkward for a while. Soon. Boom Boom seemed to notice him, as he removed his headphones and gave a weak smile. Remember that time, way back in the beginning? Bowser asked. When we were first getting started, and you convinced me to turn that Prince of the Flower Kingdom into a dog just to see if we could. Boom Boom chuckled and did some squats. Kibidengo, that's right. He was such a jerk. He actually thought Peach was gonna marry him because he had some stupid flowers. If that's all it took, we would have been together that time I took over her castle with warp pipes and dressed all my Koopas up like toads Bowser said. Or that time I actually legally married her except it was all part of some prophecy by Count, uh. I forget his name now. Boom Boom thinks it was. Count Blick. Count Mimi. Whatever. That time was really stupid and let's never talk about it again. Bowser sighed. I just wish, that we could have some real fun again. Like with Kibidengo. Just rampaging around and having a good time, not. Well. I noticed you weren't at my speech earlier. And, it got me wondering about things. Boom Boom sighed as well. Boom Boom told them he couldn't be a part of it, but they wouldn't listen. They are too loyal. Not honest at all. What now? Your big plan, the whole assembly, it was all a sham. Mad Einstein's new gas was just some perfume he and Dr. Krieger are working on. Everyone knew it, but they were going to go along with it anyway because, Bowser's hands shook. Everyone. Even his own family. Because why? Because, you've been kind of, off lately, you know. Boom Boom thinks you're really down about the stuff with the moon wedding going south. You didn't even invite Boom Boom to that plan, by the way, it was kind of impromptu, sorry. I heard K. Rule was making another run at DK and I wanted to beat him to the punch so he wouldn't have a one-up on Bowser Kingdom. That's what Boom Boom is saying said Boom Boom. You've gotten so wrapped up in all these schemes and plans that you stopped being the leader you were meant to be. You've gotten a little, depressed. And your armies just wanted to cheer you up by waging a fake war on the Mushroom Kingdom. No harm done, right? What? No harm done. What? This is infuriating. I'm not depressed. I'm just determined. What the flip? Bowser breathed a little bit of fire out of his nose, he was so angry. What other conqueror would travel back in time to kidnap his rival's own baby selves? What kind of leader would turn his mortal enemy into a pinball? Or sabotage a tennis tournament for his own gain? I am the invincible warlord of the Koopsa clan. Ah, uh, clan. Boom Boom shook his head. With respect, my lord, 
Just say Bowser, man. Bowser, you failed at those things. You lost at every single turn. And you know it. I've won plenty of times. Remember the time I defeated Smithy? Or when I beat up Fawful? And Tab, you, the ultimate villain of the entire universe. Guess who destroyed him, it, them, whatever. Those were all with Mario and Luigi. You only teamed up with them after you got defeated yourself, too. And so, a fake invasion, where I was thought to be successful, would lift my spirits. That's what everyone else thought. But how were they going to pretend to kidnap Peach? They hired Dupliss Boom Boom Sedo, he's not cheap. Not at all. Boom Boom advised against it, but... Kamek was particularly insistent about all of this. He is really worried about you. At this moment, something broke inside Bowser. His own adoptive father trying to cheer him, the great king of the Koopas, up from a depressive state. As if he was a child who needed comforting in order to move past all his insurmountable failures, but then, maybe he was like a child dot trying for all this time to be the absolute ruler of a perfectly functioning military dictatorship. Controlling all his vast dominions with the attention span of a cheap cheap. Why would such an unstoppably lame villain be worthy of anything that he had attempted time and time again? Why did he even try, you know what, boom boom. Bowser asked yeah. You're alright he said. You're really alright. Boom boom sniffled. That's, the nicest thing you've, ever said to me. Bowser put down his dumbbells and marched out of the gym. He went back to the throne room, where the vast armies at his command had mostly dispersed but were still gathered because it looked like Psycho Kamek had splurged for catering and there were a lot of Yoshi's cookies and tasty tonics out there for everyone to eat. How in the world they were paying for that without dipping into the treasury was beyond Bowser but he rarely asked of his family's personal finance situations, and he would do so no longer attention, everyone Bowser said. In an instant, the party broke up and people started returning to attention. All the shy guys in the vicinity left in a hurry. Okay, is that everyone? Yeah, whatever. Okay, so I have an announcement. The crowd waited with bated breath I quit Bowser said. I'm no longer king. I don't care who is anymore and I leave no succession. I'm going off to my villa in Vibe Island and nobody's allowed to disturb me. I'm exiling myself or whatever, so go do your own thing. Goodbye. The crowd was silent. Bowser shrugged and left the throne room again. He took one final glance at his slack jawed family and almost chuckled. He was sure they were going to have a fun time deciding who was going to rule. But it was no concern of his. He was done. Little did Bowser know, but this action would directly result in the biggest change of his entire life the obtainment of the Super Crown and the utter transformation of everything that he had previously stood for. But for now, this was just a new vacation to him. He was just glad to be gone. Bowser crushed another can of penguin proof and tossed it towards the recycle bin. Even Bowser knows that saving the planet is important. It bounced off the rim and fell onto the floor. Just like the last seven dot uh, The eighth can. Just like he always had eight main henchmen in all his stupid plans that always failed in stupid ways. And how did Wario drink this stuff? Sure, it got you drunk, but it was nasty. If it weren't the only thing left in the villa, he wouldn't have even considered pounding it down. He missed always having quick access to froggy drink. That stuff sure cured his HP real quick, once again, he started to cry, tears streaming down his face at infuriating rates. Oh, why did he pick this stupid place with its stupid magical emotion zones and these stupid beautiful scenic views and all this stupid great, ah, uh, whatever dot it had been several weeks since Bowser abdicated the throne and moved to Vibe Island, where the people were few and the nature was beautiful, or ugly and depressing depending on which emotions you were currently being forced to invoke. Or maybe it had been days. He didn't know. He'd been drinking so much he had essentially given up on keeping track of the passage of time. Who cares, not Bowser I mean, I kinda thought it'd be different, 
Bowser muttered to himself. There was literally nobody else in this villa, on final order of Bowser himself, of course, but he was still in the habit of announcing his thoughts out loud just in case anyone was listening. After all, if a koopsa falls in the middle of a forest and there's nobody to hear them, do they make a sound? Bowser didn't even know if he was really a koopsa. Sure, he had a shell, but pretty much no other koopsa looked anything like him. Maybe this was all a lie too, told to him by his stupid dumb dad Kamek and his stupid dumb grandma Kami and his stupid dumb royal title. Whatever, nobody even called to check up on him. Not one text message from King Bob Om or a consolatory call from Platterpunk, even after all that damn time they spent cornering the market with tax offices together, honestly, he just wanted someone, anyone to knock knock. Ring ring. Knock, oh my Brighton, I'm coming, I'm coming. Bowser groaned. It took an incredible amount of effort to push his way too muscled body off the ground and stumble to the front door. If he were less stupid he would have at least taken a couple servants with him, maybe a nubile young assistant who was secretly extremely infatuated with him like in Jerry Maguire, but that simply wasn't the case here. He had to open the door himself, like a peasant who is it, he asked, his vision too blurry to make anything out at first, what with the sun hitting his eyes just as all the alcohol in his blood surged to his brain. There was, nobody here. Down here a ruffled old voice said. He looked down. It was a bob on with a fantastic beard and a wheel attached to his back. Wait, how did he? Never mind my name is Admiral Bobbery he began. I was sent as a courier across these great seas to your beautiful villa to convey to you an important message. It concerns a great many topics, but for one in particular who from? Well, a Bobbery stammered. It's from, well. The royal court of the House of Toadstool Bowser slammed the door in his face. Nope. Not happening. He wasn't even going to bother listening to any of that. It was probably something like, oh no Bowser, Mario and Luigi are trapped in the dream realm and now they are being attacked by the evil Master Wart. Help us. Or something like, we need another heavy for our new karting tournament, and since you did grant us a lifetime lease on Bowser's castle track. Maybe you'd like to compete. Or, even in the best case scenario it'd be something like, Waluigi has launched a meta-nuclear missile that will circle around the Earth five times before hitting Peach's castle. Help us disarm it or the Mushroom Kingdom will be retroactively erased from having ever existed. Any result from Bowser refusing to participate would only benefit his cause of no longer giving a care about the world around him. And he would continue to do that. Hum looked like he was out of penguin proof. Now he needed to get wasted on something else, because as a giant lizard who was built like a rock, he needed way too many drinks to actually feel anything. It was almost a wasted effort on his part. To be honest. Maybe he should try drugs. He decided to go down to the armory, where they kept all the power ups seized on Vibe Island during the original takeover back, what, 10 years ago? He couldn't even remember at this point. That was the time that, instead of kidnapping Peach, his Hammer Bros thought kidnapping Mario and Luigi would be what saved them all. But little did they know, they were idiots. Peach was clearly never going to marry him that way. But even more clearly, she was powerful enough to ruin him as well. Which she did. Bowser was a failure. And he languished in it. But because Peach never destroyed this villa or anything, it looked like all the items his men stole from the Mario household were still sitting here gathering dust. He knew Mario Mario was a dust thief, so there had to be some great stuff among everything. Let's see, there were a few stars in a pile. Whenever they held parties the stars absorbed the stars that other people had collected, but he wasn't sure what they actually, did. Maybe he could, like, eat one and see, there were a couple McCarfly guys he could wind up and send flying around. That, was useless. A bunch of wooden hammers, a cricket pie, a mini mushroom, a whole chest full of e-coins, a frog suit, lots of weapons and food items. Bowser wondered if they could have used these more effectively to fight against Peach that time, there was what appeared to be a chocolate bar labeled Fudgy. He had no idea if that was a code word for drugs, 
but it definitely looked like the bar's expiration date was sometime in 1991, and he wasn't touching that dot. There was a DVD copy of the social media killer some dumb thriller movie, with a sticky note attached that said return to ninja ASAP. With the voluptuous female on the cover, Bowser wasn't sure that the movie was the type that you usually lent out very often. He wasn't touching that either. Well, for now. He wasn't sure at all why the Mario Bros had a whiskered eggplant, but he ate it without hesitation, hoping that it would get his mind racing with the thoughts of euphoria and forgetting his awful past as the world's worst villain. Sigh, nothing happened. That's basically what he expected. A lot of the power-ups here probably weren't going to work anymore, seeing as how long it had been since they were collected. He doubted that even the Poltergust 3000 sitting over in the corner would work without serious repairs, from all the cobwebs covering it. Oh, there was one promising item here. Those devious Marios and their deviant ways. They had some reverse shrooms here all along. These babies were rare but they really messed up your mind, making you move backwards against your own will. But if you just let the motion take you, and with some alcohol it was easy, it'd probably be a total trip. Bowser was just about to take one, when he noticed a glittering item way off in the corner of the room. It was a sparkling crown of gold and pink, resembling a toad's cap with a crown around it. If that were literally the case that would be disgusting and morbid, but it looked more like a special magical item dot and it was one of Peach's, ah, uh, he tried not to think about her these days. With how close they had come to actually being married, with how much he tried to show her how he cared about her, his complete failure in everything he tried was just a striking realization in his brain that he was useless. This item was surely a reminder of that dot and yet. And yet dot he took the crown, its glowing aura almost calling out to him. This probably wasn't drugs, but it was a power-up of some sort, and he wondered if. Maybe if he just kind of, Bowser's body shook. Everything went white as a shining light surrounded him. And then asterisk Bowser was in the bedroom. Not his bedroom, but that of his former wife, a room that had not been used in so long he had almost forgotten it existed. It was the only one with a full-body mirror, and he absolutely needed to use it here. His face, it was so. This black dress. This collar around his neck. This crown on his head, besides the horns and tail and shell, he looked almost exactly like Princess Peach, all the way down to his nicely shaped, ah, uh, features. He smiled, flashing several fangs. This, this felt amazing. Everything was different now. This was Bowser's new plan. Using his new form. This new female body that felt like a surge of electricity every moment he lived inside of it, he would return to the limelight. All of those blue feelings, all of that frustration deep inside of him seemed completely gone all of a sudden, as if nothing could possibly hamper him. He was going to take over the Mushroom Kingdom, and he was going to do it all by himself. No help from his loyal minions, nor his family, nor any other baddies from the rest of the world, and it wasn't going to be done from any soccer tournament nor any rhythm game dancing. It was just Bowser and his new transformation against the forces of good. It was like, just by putting on the super crown, a heavy weight had been lifted off his shoulders, even if literally, a heavy weight had been added to his shoulders. Like, damn. He was hot. This new body would be referred to as a name he just came up with, Bozetta. Queen of the Koopas, Lordess and Nomad of the Lava Wars. Of course, he was no longer a he he guest. With the body of a female, he had become a she in all but mind. But, since he was still a man on the inside, he would still go by he, at least to himself. Whatever that meant. He continued rummaging in the armory a bit longer to see what could be found. He took the Macarfly guys, just in case they could be useful in combat later, as well as the reverse mushrooms for the same reason. Then he took the E-coins in case he wanted to unlock more E-reader levels in the future. But he also found a very interesting item that really brought him a wave of nostalgia his old chomp shell, a giant mace weapon created from a dead chain chomp that he could swing around and that also could be made to bite down if you squeezed the chains just right. With all of this, he was ready to set off, 
returning from his self-imposed exile with a villainous tremor and a climactic showdown. He wouldn't let it be a surprise assault, either, he would take the scenic route, and he would not let anyone stand in his way he decided to take a new laugh. KKKKK, he cackled. This would be the ultimate trademark of his inevitable victories. Before he let Princess Peach and the Mushroom Kingdom consume his interest, Bowser used to be much more powerful, so much more ruthless. He was the one that led a five year war to overthrow Morton Koopsa. He was the one that wandered the Kalimari Desert and collected all four pieces of the Firestone Amulet, the one who amassed the Great Koopsa Troop and its great generals King Bobom, King Boo, Homp King, Gumboss. General Guy and the Crystal King. It took a great many months and many duels to place each of these fine men under his command, but he did so, and with their cooperation, and the power of the false Millennium Star, they made the Dark Land the democratic, free haven it was today. Bowser decided that he was no longer going to be the sniveling Crybaby, the sore loser he once was. This may have been the anger side of Vibe Island's emotional tampering speaking but he felt a great urge to destroy everything in his path. Just because he wanted to dot so without further ado, it was time for Bowser to depart from his villa. He would detonate it, of course, with some spare bob in the holding cells. To make a statement or whatever. It didn't matter. And then he would take a boat. No, he would swim all the way to the shore, wherever that took him. And then from there, he would begin his singular march towards the Mushroom Kingdom. For the man who nearly conquered the universe, for the man that once wielded the Star Rod, nothing was truly impossible if he set his mind to it. It was time to go and introduce the world to Bozet. Wait. One more thing. He probably needed to put some clothes on first. It was in the Bone Dragon Pit where three Yoshis blue, pink, and white fell to the ground, beaten down by this woman in a black dress. This woman with sharp claws and a sharper glance chumps, she shouted. All of you, chumps. She was Bozette, the new scourge to the world. The talk of the town, if the town talked about dangerous menaces. And she simply could not be beaten. These Yoshis were just three among the dozens that had tried to stop her advance as she blew her way through Yoshi's Island in search of one specific denizen. The Bone Dragon itself. These creatures were the remains of dreadlords that were said to have roamed the earth eons ago, wreaking havoc and destroying everything in their paths just because they could. They were stopped by something or another, and their bones scattered across the world in the hopes that they would remain forgotten. For the most part, they were, other than the famous skull beneath the icy town center in Snowflake Lake but there was a nearly complete skeleton left forgotten deep in the core of Yoshi's Island, and it appeared that this new Bozet being, whoever she was, had uncovered its secrets. The white Yoshi, in its last moments before passing out, watched as Bozet held out her palm, activating some sort of magic spell that summoned the three heads of the bone dragon to greet her. Hail me, she shouted. I am the Lordess Bozet, and I have come to... Asterisk Plum swung her club and the golf ball went flying into the air, straight towards the flagpole off in the distance. If she was lucky, and if her aim was true, she would get a hole in one here, putting her in first place for the tournament, nice shot, some disembodied announcer shouted. The ball rolled onto the green, spun a little bit, and landed right in the hole. Wow, Sherry high-fived her. Good going, girl she said. You're gonna enter the pro leagues yet. Ah, I doubt that said Plum. I'm nowhere near good enough to do that, Sunny stepped up and patted her on the back. Oh, Plum, you are just gotta believe in yourself he said. I sure as pie believe in you. Oh, Sunny, Plum grabbed his cheek and planted a kiss on the lips. He took his hat off and put it at his chest. We'll see how things go. Bam. A loud stomp. A golf club thudding against the grass, hard enough to shake the ground around Plum and the others. They turned around. A toothy grin from a woman in an extremely low cut dress, glaring deep into them with her deep red eyes, smoldering irons in a furnace. Wordlessly, she set down a golf ball on the tee and swung at it with mad power. The golf ball flew into the air and crashed into the hole with blazing speeds exploding and causing a large tremor. When the smoke cleared, Plum. 
looked back at the golf course, where there was a now a massive crater where the hole used to be. The woman next to them merely cackled. Asterisk Mallow shot bolts of lightning out at Bozette, but she was too quick, too nimble, too quick, too nimble. This woman, holding no weapons but still shooting fire from her mouth, was almost unstoppable. She had climbed her way up Sky Garden and reached the Meringue Clouds, a peaceful realm that until now had seen little in the way of invasion or warfare, other than occasional coup-hailing incursions. Now, however, the entire realm was being threatened by just one being. Bozette kicked Mallow in the air and he flew through several clouds. He was the last line of defense before Nimbus Land, his home. And as prince, it was his duty to protect it, whatever the cost. He shot more lightning bolts, one of them very nearly hitting her, but it wasn't enough. Mallow had no style, no grace, and now, with Bozette's fist pummeling into him, he had a funny face. He almost laughed, but he lost consciousness too quickly. A deliberation of kings. Gumboss stood with Toadsworth as the leaders of all nations across the world looked over a huge model map resting out on the table in front of them. Never in a million years did Gumboss think he would have to stoop so low as to work with the goody two shoes of the Mushroom Kingdom. Especially never with the despicable Waterland King, whose craven rule had cost the lives of thousands of Gumba over the years. But here he was. All because of this. Bozette. All the machinations in Dark Land had pushed him completely out of the sphere of influence, and now he was essentially on his own, being forced to team with these leaders as his allies in protecting his domain. Pauline, mayor of the independent nation of New Donk City, stood up and pointed with a long pointy stick, going over each area marked with a red flag. As you can see here, Bozette was following a set path. She first appeared off the coast, attacking the baseball kingdom and bringing it to its knees in 48 hours. She moved the pointed to locations on the shore. Once she emerged again it was at Sunset Beach, convincing the populace of Coopers to revolt against the majority Mouser government. Mustafa hopped up to the table in a rage. The people of the dry dry desert will not stand for it. She must be stopped. The problem with that is Pauline began. We don't know a thing about her. She travels alone, so we can't pinpoint her location until she strikes. She's too fast, too unpredictable. That is, until now. She makes a path with her pointer. For a long while, Bozette was marching in essentially one straight path. She moved across the coast, going through the cheap cheap beach before moving north after severely damaging the dolphin shoals. She then ravaged the Sprixes, who had already had their land devastated by Bowser in recent times. Lumsey, the leader of the Free Kremlin Alliance that towered over the others in the audience, raised his hand. But. Bowser, what about him, he asked Bowser isn't a factor here Pauline said. His kingdom is too far away from the rest of this and according to sources is currently occupied in some family squabbles. Plus. Bowser's kingdom may not want to help. For this Bozette woman, whoever she is, Pauline points a straight path from the Sprixy kingdom, through the Toad Highlands, through the Toadwood Forest, and then going dangerously close to Shroom City, where the formal border of the Mushroom Kingdom begins. It is clear to us that she is aiming for the Mushroom Kingdom, likely aiming to take down Princess Peach herself. But, why? Toadsworth asked. What have we done to provoke this mysterious woman? Well, there is the fact that this Bozette woman is reported to look uncannily like Princess Peach. She held up a scroll that contained a sketch of what this woman appeared to look like according to police reports after a fierce battle in Hollajolly Village. Gumboss stared at it with his mouth open. Holy damn, was that her? Now he was interested. Look at those pointy horns. Look at those huge, ah, uh, earrings. Whatever her reason, she was on a direct course for the Mushroom Kingdom, but suddenly veered off just days ago. Don Pinata shrugged. The people of Rogaport have no interest in this. We are too remote and not a strategic location now that the thousand-year door has been sealed. We will tend to our own matters. This could be very important Pauline said. Don't give in to your own insular nature when the entire world could be at stake. 
The bumpty leader Maya Penguin chimed in, as well. Because Bozette seems to be making her intentions known only to the southern portions of the continent, I suffice it to be known that we shall not participate in any sort of coalition. What? They were giving up like that. No help at all. Gumbos could not stand for this. You cretins, he shouted. This monster is at the doorstep of Gumba village, and yet you refuse to help. What kind of allies are you? Says the one who terrorized the Mushroom Kingdom for years scoffed Monty Mole. Gumbos had no idea which Monty Mole, just that it was one of many. Your claim of territorial ownership over Goomba village is extremely tenuous King Lakitu added. Your right to be in this meeting, even, is tenuous. How dare you? Calm down, everyone Pauline said. We have to work together. Because we have no idea what Bozette's next plan is. She's ventured to various parts of the world in recent days, for no reason that we have been able to uncover thus far. She has been to Yoshi's Island, then to the Woody Woods, then to Neon Heights, and finally to Nimbus Land, only staying for brief moments while causing maximum chaos. But none of these areas are remotely close to the Mushroom Kingdom, so we are unable to, Pauline stopped. The entire meeting had turned into an uproar, with leaders yelling at each other and bickering and no longer listening. She had wanted to tell them that Bozette's current course of destruction was headed straight back to the Mushroom Kingdom, that she would be there in a matter of days. But it was too late for them to listen, she realized that it may have been too late for everything. A few toad guardsmen held up their spears, but Bowser swept his wrist gently and knocked them away like it was a gust of wind kkkkkk. Bowser, under the guise of this mysterious new Bozette had done little more than waltz wherever she went and still found great victory. Everywhere she went, she had terrorized the populace, decimated any combat forces that attempted to defeat her. Ah, uh, him. He was starting to lose track of that thing, to be honest. Dot it had gotten to the point where, everyone was so terrified of him that he was able to stay at a luxury hotel at the Huckett Beach Resort for free, complete with a complimentary breakfast and room service. He didn't even get this kind of treatment as Bowser. It was awesome, needless to say, he ordered more than a few able juices that night. Man it felt good to drink genuinely good alcohol again. From the Sunset Wilds to Ribbon Road, from the Pecan Sands to the Wonky Circus, everywhere he went he destroyed and destroyed and blew up and raged. It was frigging great. He had realized by the time he reached the Mushroom Kingdom that he was not yet ready to end all of this, in fact, and had decided to travel a few more places. That was probably smart thinking, too, he was going to be in for the fight of a lifetime with the probable opponents he would be facing momentarily, and he needed every advantage he could get, especially in what he uncovered when he ventured up Star Hill just a few hours ago. It wasn't the Star Rod or its remains, like he had hoped but it was a star shard itself, and with Bozette's magic, ah, uh, Bowser's magic, he could infuse the power of the star inside his chomp shell, creating a weapon that was now supercharged with eternal energies. Nobody who did not directly harness magic for themselves could stand a chance against it. To this point, Bozette had not yet been forced to use any of the items she had obtained before or during her journey. She was very glad for this, as it let forces continue to underestimate her, and she would be able to take the advantage once the ultimate fight began. But even here, if she could, she would keep to using simply her claws, her fire breath, and hiding in her shell to block attacks. Any weapon or item was her last resort. But she had gained some rather hefty goods in her divergent excursions over the last week. Besides the bone dragon hidden away in Yoshi's Island, she wait, he. Crap. Bowser was starting to really get confused here. He also obtained several interesting orbs from Neon Heights, including some spark orbs and twister orbs that would come in handy if things got too rough. He could shock and stun enemies as well as send them flying in random directions, so they were good for defense. 
The caveat was that they needed to be thrown and they rested in a static position once deployed, and Bozet analyzed that the fight may move too quickly for them to be as effective as he wanted. In the woody woods he beat up some trees until they gave him a free barter box. This was an extremely rare item, not to be used lightly. Though its power to swap items with another nearby was typically reserved for party antics, it could also be extremely useful in a combat situation. Finally, in Nimbus Land, he uncovered an ancient treasure, the Sonic Symbols. Bozet was very much appreciative of the fact that he had been classically schooled in itemology, otherwise, he would never have been able to find all these weapons and utilize them so well. Along with his reverse mushrooms and macafly guys obtained back at Vibe Island, he possessed a white arsenal and would be able to take over the Mushroom Kingdom with ease, as long as he acted accordingly. Bozet had very, very much wanted to find some greater power at Star Hill. It seems that after his little attack on the Star Sanctuary all those years ago, their defenses were stronger, and he was unable to sneak out any extra power for himself. With any luck, though, he wouldn't need it his current state would simply be enough. Now, it was time to advance through Toad Town and make his way towards his final destination, Peach's Castle. He could have used an army. The Coopers that had revolted at Sunset Beach had offered to join him. The Homps had sent an emissary to meet him after he burnt down the fuzzy hideout. His old contacts at the Snifit Bureau were eager to see his new quest through, as well. Even Game Guy wanted to donate funds to a new insurrection war effort against the Mushroom Kingdom. But he made it very clear to any and all groups that this would be a solo effort. He was going to be defeating everyone, and that included them themselves. He needed to do this, and without anyone else's help. The streets were clear. Only two Dugans hawking badges for sale over in the corner, seemingly unaware of what was about to go down. Actually, now that Bozet thought about it, hey. Bozet shouted, his voice shriek and pitchy. Give me some of them, will ya? He gazed at the selection more closely. The Dodge Master badge allowed him to use action commands more frequently, but the Double Dip badge let for using two items at the same time. And multi-bounce. That was a powerful one. All of them were so irresistible. But if he had to choose. Give me Dodge Master. Avoiding being hit was going to be tantamount to success here, he imagined. Going the long haul rather than trying to a quick victory was the best option. 300 coins, man, pay up, the larger Dugan shouted. Gimme some cash. Normally, Bozet would simply shoot a fireball and fry the guy. But he was feeling mighty generous this moment, and the sheer gusto of ordering him around amused him. So he took out his change purse and dumped its entire contents on the ground, which was hundreds upon hundreds of coins as well as those brown sacks filled with more coins inside of them. Ha ha ha, the Dugan laughed. Take em all. Take em all. Thanks, lady. And Bozette did. But he did not appreciate being called a lady, not as much as he thought he would. He was a man, a strong hulking monster with the masculinity of a thousand sons. This body of his was merely an impediment to success, the training weights that intentionally limited his abilities to keep his focus strong. In essence, his weakness made him powerful. His weak, fleshy body was low in defense, low in power, even if it was high in beauty. But he would win despite that. He would win because of that dot with perfect timing. A mushroom-shaped spaceship set down right in front of him, blocking his path to Peach's castle. He would get to test out his new abilities on some weaker opponents before reaching the main stage. Out of the spaceship ran six toads, each of them with a different cap color. He did not recognize them whatsoever. Hey, you, the red one, clearly the leader, yelled. Get out of here. Bozette shrugged. Or what? The red toad took out a pickaxe. Bro, leave. No. These toads were clearly unprepared for an actual fight. The blue one scurried back into the spaceship, while the other ones stood still and shook in fear. Bozette took a few steps forward, especially towards the pink-capped female. 
She looked like she was about to perish here and there, she was so scared. He looked at her and licked his lips. The female toad fainted. The red one, though, charged forward. Not cool, bro. He swung his pickaxe and attacked, missing by wide margins. Toad Brigade, let's go. Bozette hardly had to move an inch to get past all of this. The spaceship took off and began hovering in the air, but it appeared to have no weapons because it was not firing. Sigh. This may have been too easy of a fight. Let's mix this up he said to himself. He leapt onto the spaceship, activating his multibounce and repeatedly stomping on the roof of the ship until the metal dented in. The bouncing was actually somewhat tough to pull off. The Super Crown's power gave Bozette the ability to float in the air, just like Princess Peach, and at first that had severely inhibited his ability to do quickly timed jumps like he wanted. With more practice came more control, but he would never be able to perfect it. Still, he got what he wanted. He burst into the spaceship and punched the blue toad, whose glasses flew off and cracked against the window. He leapt out and floated back towards the ground, just as the spaceship crashed into an item shop and exploded. The red toad was now red in the face. You won't get away with this, he shouted KKKK. Bozette laughed still floating a few inches in the air. Of course I will. I'm Bozette, Lordess of the Koopsa Spirit. Lordess, of the... What? The red toad was very confused. The pink toad got up from her fainting, but was instantly petrified upon seeing Bozette again. Whatever. I'm going to beat you all up now, is what I mean he said. The pink toad suddenly stopped freaking out and stared at Bozette intensely. Wait a minute. That crown on your head, isn't that? Suddenly Bozette was the one petrified, surrounded by an aura of blue magic on all sides. A deep voice bellowed, Trespasser. You will go no further. He was unable to turn around, but his captor soon rotated him around for him. It was that nasty old wizard, Merlong. Probably the strongest being in the Mushroom Kingdom by sheer force, and the one that he was most worried of when he had entered Toad Town let go of me you clod. Bozette shouted you are under my control now said Merlong. You belong to me. It looked like Bozette was trapped, with a crotchety old wizard setting him down on a table and beginning to rummage through some old books. Merlong. Nasty little man who had always been a thorn in Bozette's side when he was the king of the lava world, lord of the Koopsa troop and grandmaster of the magical arts. Now he was merely Bozette, half-human lordess of power, standing up to Merlong now was a fruitless effort, because in this form his powers weren't half as potent. He couldn't escape the aura barrier that the man had encased him in I am very interested to understand you, Bozette Merlong said. Ever since your first appearance, we of the Ma family have been delighted to see you in person, to, study your abilities. Merlong leered at Bozette. They are quite enticing. Ah. This was, revolting, Bozette felt ashamed and embarrassed at the same time. What a creepy shaman he was. He had never had anything like this said to him before, and he realized how lucky he had always been. Merlong raised both hands in the air and some sparks began to fly out. Reveal your true self to me. Show me the true limits of your power, Bozette. His eyes closed as he began to shake and levitate slightly in the air. The aura around Bozette began to flicker. Bozette struggled to move, maybe in this moment, if he budged right, he could escape but it didn't seem so. The best he could do was rummage through his pockets, go inside his shell and hope to find something. Uh, he grabbed out a twister orb and rolled it off the table he laid on, it passed through the aura barrier and smashed against the floor with ease. If Bozette couldn't escape, then at least he could do that. Merlong's magic lit up the room in an all-new shade of blue, bright and dark at the same time in a way that could hardly be explained. Whatever was happening Bozette could barely comprehend it, let alone figure out a way to circumvent it. His super crown began to glow, and the shades of blue gave way to a new vision, a new world where Bozette, still trapped at a table, was presented with an entire existence zooming around before him. It was like all of his ancestors appearing before him. 
his biological ones the royal family stretching back a thousand generations. He saw Morton, sixteen feet high and towering over his enemies with a mighty axe. He saw his ancestor of five generations back, a woman of science and magic combined, wearing a large cloak as she poured over experimental formulas and brought the bones of Coopus back to life. He saw a distant uncle piloting a massive airship blasting towards a distant galaxy, his beard as long as a mountain and eyes as deep as a collapsing star. He saw an ancient ancestor, the tenth generation since a celestial dragon and Koopsa had found love, and a being so large they dwarfed all others Bozet had already seen, a vast army surrounded and attacked them, but they regarded them with less notice than an ant dot and those ancestors circled around him hovering in the air and looking down on Bozette's new body of skin and hair. Morton Koopsa shook his head, and the others followed. Bozette was a failure. He wasn't good enough. It was all useless. There was nothing Bozette could accomplish that hadn't already been done by someone that had come before him, and done better than he was capable of. The ancestors laughed at him. He was so weak that he had made himself weaker. That was the hilarious way to finally cap off their legacy, fading away just as the celestial blood inside them had dissipated. It was the magic was over. Mayor Long looked over at Bozette with narrowed eyes. I can't help but stare, he muttered you. Get away from me, Bozette growled I may have to he snickered. You are, so powerful. More powerful than I could have ever imagined. It's understandable that you were able to advance so far so quickly. Did you even know that inside of you glows the heart of true royalty? Probably not. Your kind was always ignorant to your own capabilities. What do you mean? I'll explain it to you Mayor Long said. I'll teach you a lot. See, because I captured you so quickly, the others do not yet know you have arrived. That means we are away from prying eyes. We have all the time in the world, he snickered again time enough for life to unfold all the precious things it has in store, oh, underwear no, Bozette was not staying here any longer hey, mere long guy. Wizard dude. Bozette asked hey. See you around. Oh, I'll be seeing you. In fact, once I take you downstairs you'll be seeing a lot of me. Nerlum has arrived from Flopside to see this through, and my dear relative Mayor Luvi will be arriving shortly. Together we will figure out some tests for you, to help gauge the true potential of your magical Bozette clenched his fist and activated the twister. A cyclone formed right there in the middle of the room. The roof off Mayor Long's house was the first to go, jolting up into the air and breaking up into a few dozen pieces. Then Mayor Long and Bozette lifted off together. In the surprise, the aura surrounding Bozette had finally broken and Bozette was able to kick Mayor Long upwards, flying further into the air. Without a moment to spare Bozette tumbled back down to the ground and landed feet first somewhere in Toad Town. Had he stayed in the Twister any longer, he would be halfway to Sarraza Land by now. He looked back into the Toad Town skyline, where Peach's castle still remained in plain sight. He was not much further back than he was just minutes ago. Progress never stopped. But those visions he saw. They were so poignant, so realistic. He started to wonder whether it was his imagination or if his ancestors truly had been ashamed of him. Regardless, it was time for him to fulfill his destiny and conquer the Mushroom Kingdom once and for all. He ventured past the gate with the huge star embroidered on it, past the toad guards too scared to do anything about him, past the bunnies scurrying around with power stars hidden inside them. He stood at the bridge in front of the front door and took out the sonic symbols he obtained from Nimbus Land. One quick crash and the entire region reverberated, shaking like the earth rumbled beneath them. Little did they know the truth of the grounds below them, but the Mushroom Kingdom would surely recognize the sheer strength before them. Quickly, a number of figures exited the front door, with two emerging behind him from warp pipes. Each of them looked angry each of them determined to face the mighty Bozette and be the one to stop him. From his field of vision, he noticed nine there was a green Yoshi, huffing and puffing with six eggs trailing behind him. There was Princess Daisy of Sarazaland. 
wearing bike shorts and holding a soccer ball in her arms. Behind him there was Luigi, shaking in fear, and Badu, standing tall with a bow on her head. There was Admiral Bobbery, shaking his head forward slash body in apparent realization of Bozette's true identity. He was wise beyond his years but not wise enough to avoid his battle. There was Donkey Kong Jr., which to be honest was kind of a weird pick, as well as a man Bozette didn't recognize. There was Vivian, the reformed shadow siren who stuck up halfway from the ground, and next to her was Mario Mario, Bozette's mortal enemy. Bozette wasn't here for this large group, though. Bozette could defeat them. All he wanted was Princess Peach, and she was not here, is this it? He scoffed with a shrill voice. Surely you can do better than this. I am the Lord S. Bozette, destroyer of the waking world. Do you not dare bring me your precious Princess Peach, pretty please? I'm here a voice said. Peach herself was there, but on the roof of the castle. She jumped down and floated gracefully to the ground. What do you want with us? Pauline warned us about you, and... Peach stopped as she got a closer look at Bozette. Clearly, their extremely similar appearance was disconcerting to the woman herself, and her show-stopping good looks were having an obvious effect on all the fighters around him. I want to destroy you and take over the Mushroom Kingdom, he answered. That's my only goal right now. Well then, will you challenge me in solo combat? Peach asked Peach. Daisy exclaimed. What are you I'll gladly accept that, as long as your fighters make sure to surrender peacefully when I defeat you. KKKK. Peach nodded and took out a frying pan. I accept those terms, as well. We will Badu and Yoshi began launching eggs at Bozette, he deflected each of them with his claws, but they still took him by surprise and he took the brunt of the force impact of the first couple cancel that, then. Bozette laughed hopping backwards and confronting the ten people in front of him. I guess I'll defeat all of you. First things first, Bozette took out all the orbs he owned and tossed them on the ground. They were invisible to the eye except for the owner, but as long as Bozette could keep track on them it would be an easy way to trap his opponents. Seeing as they were all charging simultaneously, this was going to be easier than he thought. Mario himself took out a large hammer jumping into the air to swing it so predictable. How about you go find some better way to settle this? Bozette yelled. He activated the twister orb below Mario and blasted him away. He'd be back, and soon, but eliminating the primary threat fast was going to make this fight a lot more smooth. Now with nine opponents before him, he needed to thin the crowd out as quickly as possible, even if that meant focusing on the weaker ones first. He used his Dodge Master badge to weave through a volley of punches and kicks from Yoshi and Daisy, as well as a surprise uppercut from Vivan that would otherwise have sent him flying several feet in the air. And then he surveyed everyone to identify some weak points. The admirable admiral himself, Bobbery, was a danger to himself and those around him, what with his exploding powers and all, so he would be a good target to blast several opponents away. But it looked like. Standing in his way of that was, ah, uh, some guy. He had long brown hair and a green cap, but Bozette didn't think he had ever seen him before, and he didn't look like he was exactly combat ready who, who are you? Bozette asked what do you mean? I'm Prince Pine. What? What? Prince Pine, of Jewelry Land. I'm one of the Royal Society members. Pretty famous, you know. Frigging jewelry land. You mean that one Bozette took over in like five seconds and split into a light and dark realm so that Bowser could harness extra dimensional darkness soul magic? Why the heck are you here? I. I was having tea with Princess Peach. Prince Pine yelled. But I will have you know, I was trained by Kung Fu Toads at Pagoda Peak for two years, and I Bozette slapped him across the face and he smacked into the castle door, knocked out immediately. That made eight. Yoshi and Badu, teamed up as usual, chattered incomprehensibly in their native tongues. Well, Badu didn't have a tongue, but her native nasal noises and simultaneously launched eggs at Bozette. He wasn't falling for that trick again, and instead of swiping at the eggs to break them, Taking some of the damage, he leapt into the air and kicked Yoshi in the face. 
he floated to the ground slowly but at the perfect angle to land right in front of Bobbery, who unleashed a series of kicks, but not ones that would much hurt Bozet you could have helped us Admiral Bobber said. We were inviting you to a tennis tournament. Bozet multibounced off Bobber's head. Who cares about tennis when I'm supreme overlordess of the Mushroom Kingdom? Bozet asked in a sing-songy tone. Finally, he kicked Bobbery towards Yoshi and Badu, who split apart as they jumped away from the bob -omb. But he didn't explode, didn't explode, not yet. He was only severely ticked off. A soccer ball blasted towards Bozet, hitting him in the back of the head and knocking him down briefly. Had he not been Bowser himself, that kick would likely have been powerful enough to have caught his hair on fire. Luckily, that was not the case. As Daisy landed, she stuck one leg into the air, ready to dash forward while kicking a bunch of times. Bozet grinned and responded by shooting a fireball out of her mouth. Daisy leapt over it, but in an awkward, exposed stance. So Bozet grabbed hold of Bobbery, lit the string attached to his head on fire, and threw him towards her. The explosion was immense and knocked both opponents out completely. With Yoshi and Badu now separated on the battlefield, this was going to be an easier fight, especially with only six to fight. Badu was next to Donkey Kong Jr., who stood there smiling like he didn't understand what was going on. He probably didn't hey furball, get a load of this. Bozet struck a seductive pose, putting an arm behind his head and leaning back slightly, and that seemed to set Donkey Kong Jr.'s heart aflame, because hearts literally burst out from his eyes and he started dashing over towards him. Badu followed, trying to stop him, but it was too late. Bozet gripped a nearby tree, ripped it from the ground, and swung it into Donkey Kong Jr. and Badu, knocking the former clear over the castle itself. Five left. Badu skidded back onto her feet, and closer again to Yoshi, and the two continued their volley of eggs. Bozet was able to dodge the eggs easily, though, and hopped into her shell any time one got too close, which absorbed any damage that would otherwise be done. When he found his next targets, Peach and Vivian, he hopped into the air, entered his shell, and rotated so that it fell down spike side down, nearly crushing Vivian had she not been able to evaporate into a shadow on the ground. Darn it, that would have been such a good finishing move, why 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 you should give up said Luigi, who was standing in the exact same place as before and still shaking up, no. Bozet put a finger up to his lips. Maybe you could give yourself up, though, and I might spare you. He winked. Luigi's face turned red and he curled up into a ball. Peach sighed. Grow a pair, Luigi. She tossed him a power star, and he caught it, but he was still too afraid and embarrassed to get up now it's just you and me Bozet said to Peach. Call them off so we can finally settle this, woman oh a woman oh that's not how you, Peach stopped herself. They won't call themselves off. And you know what? That's Peach hopped in the air and flew towards Bozet, her hip crashing into his stomach and then exploding on impact. Bozet was knocked to the ground. Okay. Bozet got up, but he realized he was surrounded on all sides. Peach in front of him, Yoshi and Badu to the right, Vivian to his left, and technically Luigi behind him watch this. Bozet shouted. He spread his arms wide and unleashed all the Macarfly guys he had been saving since Vibe Island, flying around at random chaotic speeds and really splicing up the battlefield where nobody could reach him with their attacks. Yoshi and Badu's eggs were effectively neutralized as each of their eggs collided into a mechanical doll with little damage done to it. He took this opportunity to single out Badu and swipe her backwards with his tail. She shouted something but it was just like... Buzz 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 so Bozet couldn't adequately respond to it. Instead, he shot a fireball her way and knocked her into Yoshi. Both were highly injured and just about knocked out, but they got back up and started holding hands. Oh no, were they going to try some sort of fusion magic or spirit combo or some tennis ultra smash that would act effectively as a special combat move? It didn't matter kkkkk. Because they were standing right underneath a spark orb trap, Yoshi and Badu were caught and shocked for a good 10 seconds, 
both collapsed on the ground afterwards. That left just three, and while Luigi was now on his feet, it didn't seem that he Bozette could no longer move. He was stuck in midair, mid laugh even, and his body was in a strange inverted color. Luigi hopped into this sphere of stasis and began punching Bozette several times in several places. He didn't feel anything, though, so Luigi must have been even weaker than he thought. This was surely the power of the negative zone, harnessing the power of Subkin in a way that few but Luigi himself could understand, considering how poorly understood that realm was. But it did not appear to be effective. When the stasis field disappeared, though, Bozette's body felt the full force of impact from every attack that Luigi had delivered in those 10 seconds. He was sent reeling, tumbling backwards, and then smashed onto the ground, all at once. That, really hurt, he got back up, but he was definitely going to have a few bruises in the morning okay, now I guess we'll get serious about this Bozette said. He took out his chomp shell chain, glittering with star shard energy, and began spinning it around. Let's fight. Luigi had now officially entered the fight, having dealt a considerably amount of damage to Bozette without Bozette having been able to counteract it. Mario would probably soon be returning to the battlefield, so Bozette was stopped trying to hold back as he had been doing before. He unveiled his chomp shell weapon, infused with the star shard powers that had a glimmer of star rod wish abilities inside it. It wasn't much but it was going to neutralize any magical defenses any of them had, most notably on Peach herself. She spun the chain around, and remembered how good it felt to have a real, solid weapon in her hands, which she had barely done since her fight with Smithy all those years ago. Bozette was a powerful woman and she was going to obliterate anyone who stood in her way, just as she always had in her life. She may have been a complete failure to everyone in her life but she was going to succeed at this, at least. She had to dot Vivian snuck up to her side and tried to grab her and restrain her, but a McCarthy guy got in her way and Bozette was able to dodge. She swung the chomp in her face and knocked her out of her own shadow, flying several feet away. She wasn't sure how that worked, exactly. Bozette once again realized he was referring to himself as a she but realized that this was not exactly an opportune time to be thinking about things like that. Who the heck cared about what Boist was except a conqueror, anyway? Not her. Him. Whatever, Bozette jumped ten feet into the air and launched a series of five fireballs at the ground all of them missing the three remaining opponents but limiting their ability to move around. The McCarthy guys were mostly dispersed now, but they were also restricting the three, and now he had them right where he wanted. He landed with a thud, swung his chomp, and sacked Peach away. Luigi threw some punches and kicks but they all missed and Peach pushed him far enough back that he couldn't do anything. He tried to activate the negative zone again but it looked like Bozette's chomp's magic was counteracting it. All right, what are you going to do, green guy? Bozette taunted. He took out the power star that Peach had given him before, the ultimate trump card, just as he had planned. Bozette was loath to use it, but he felt like it was the best move. Using the double dip badge, he decided to utilize two of his items at once the barter box, and the reverse shroom dot in an instant, as he activated the reverse shroom that would normally mess up his own coordination, the barter box instantly teleported that shroom to Luigi's hand and transferred the effects to him. And in Bozette's hands, a power star appeared. He pocketed that for future use. Luigi tried to run towards Bozette, but realized he was somehow running backwards. He sent a punch, but then punched himself in the face. He ran away from the battlefield and that left just two dot well, three, because Mario was fast approaching, and it would be any moment before he arrived again. In fact he was taking a bit too long you're a devious woman Peach said. What do you want? Who are you? That doesn't matter, does it? Bozette clobbered Peach with the chomp again. Vivian grabbed at him again, this time succeeding at restraining him and touching him in areas that were highly inappropriate. Hey, get off, sister, he yelled sorry. Vivian moved her arms and restrained him by the shoulders instead ha. Huh? Psyche. 
Bozette now had enough freedom of movement to jump forward and turn upside down, sending Vivian flying to the ground and loosening her from him. So guess what ha? Huh? Bozette jumped into her own shell, tilted upside down, and slammed her spikes right into Vivian. She poofed away, leaving only her unconscious shadow behind. Now it was only Peach. And this princess would Mario jumped down from the top of the castle and clobbered him in the face. Ugh. Rude. But it was good to see him. His ultimate rival and enemy, the most tenacious and determined man in all of the earth. Mario ran over to Vivian, pulled her out of her shadow, and hugged her tightly. He was always a ladies' man, after all Mario. Oh, Mario, Bozette chuckled. Mario gulped. He was a man of few words, but he was obviously flustered. Fighting an opponent who looked so much like Peach. Maybe he would hold back. Maybe Mario, having consumed a fire flower, sometime in the past five seconds, shot several fireballs her way. Bozette counted and shot a few of her own, colliding with each of them and sending several explosions in the air. Mario leapt a few times and reached Peach's side. He took her hand you know why you will never defeat us. Peach asked why is that. Bozette asked with an innocent tone, putting a finger against his chin because your heart is dark. You have no love inside you. You're a monster consumed with hatred and that's all you'll ever be. Bozette smirked. You don't know a thing about me. We know enough. Peach plucked a turnip out of the ground and tossed it Bozette's way. But it was not just a normal turnip, it was a bob on turnip, Bozette attempted to dodge but he was unable to get far enough away to avoid the blast, and it knocked him away oh, great, there was another problem. Luigi was back. And he was wearing superhero clothes. Mr. L is here. Luigi shouted. Have no fear. Bozette growled. Why does it always have to be Mr. L? Mr. L hopped into the air, and with no explanation millions of machine parts began to surround him, forming some giant machine. A Maka it was Brabo, now Bozette was facing a giant machine. That's cool. Cool, cool, cool how are you going to face the mighty Mr. L now? Luigi asked in a loud declaration from the top of his Maka well. I wasn't planning on using this, but, Bozette stuck his hand out and his palm began glowing white with magical energy. The ground shook you see he began. I know a lot about the Mushroom Kingdom. I sure know about the tunnels underneath Peach's castle, that's for sure. He didn't add that it was because he had invaded the Mushroom Kingdom countless times already, and that he had once built his own castle underneath hers just for a stupid kidnapping plot. You see, back in the time of the Ancients, in the time before the Toads and the Koopas and the Goomba had taken over the majority of the population, there were a great many species that lived entirely underground. There still are but it is nothing like back then. What I had discovered is that you can traverse much more of the continent much faster if you go through some of these tunnels. And because of that, I could have invaded the Mushroom Kingdom from right under your noses. But instead, I kept these tunnels for my personal use. Bozette's timing was not as perfect as he had hoped. Let's try that again. Personal use. Right at the perfect moment, out from under the ground burst a three-headed skeleton beast, the bone dragon that Bozette had uncovered and brought to his side back on Yoshi's island. He did not want to have an army. He spurned all his allies. But for any last-ditch efforts, he had to have his own trump card. A tamed beast. And here it was. The bone dragon roared with all three heads, and attacked the Brabo. Luigi was going to be occupied for now. So this would be the final stage of the battle. Bozette was going to win. Mario, Peach Luigi, Bowser. That's a pretty normal lineup. This would typically be the moment when those three, possibly accompanied by some toad or another, would foil Bowser's ultimate plan and destroy his fortress just as they push him into some lava and severely injure him. But Bozette was different. Something about this new body. This new plan gave him such a feeling of elation and power that he hadn't felt for so long. And he would utilize that energy to destroy anything in his path. Mario, 
fire flower power up inside him, shot forward with fireballs, then blowing his super cape forward to increase the intensity of the flames. Bozet let each of them hit him, absorbing them inside of him. He wasn't entirely sure that would happen but he was glad that it did kkkkk. Bozet sent all of the fireballs back at Mario and they blew up at him, costing his power up and turning him into mini Mario. The bone dragon bit into the Brabo with two of its three heads while the third bashed its head into the cockpit. It punched Pack but there were too many targets and its fists could find no specific target. Within minutes, the Brabo was destroyed and Luigi was sent falling to the ground, his Mr. L costume tattered and ruined. Mini Mario jumped on Bozette's head a few times, which kinda hurt, and he was worried the crown might fall off, but it wasn't enough to do any real damage. Bozette took the adorable little guy, just three feet tall, and shook his head. Mario, Mario, Mario. What am I going to do with you? Let me go he shouted with a squeaky high-pitched voice. Okay. Bozette let Mini Mario go and kicked him. Kicked him really hard, Mario flew past the castle grounds, past Toad Town, past the Mushroom Kingdom, past the curvature of the earth, and he was gone. Bozette clasped his hands together and closed his eyes smiling. I can't believe it's gone so smoothly. Peach, though, wasn't having it. She attacked with her frying pan, swinging it wildly, and missing wildly as well. Bozette took the frying pan and threw it aside. He grabbed Peach by the back of her dress and pulled her close you're done, Princess Toadstool. Bozette entered Peach's castle. It was far from the first time, and as of now it would be far, far from the last let me, go. Peach shouted, struggling to get away from Bozette's grip. Bozette responded by tossing her forward, and she skidded across the way to polished floor until she brushed up against the staircase at the back of the foyer. This is mine now Bozette said. I've beaten you and you should surrender yourself and all your forces unless you want more people to get hurt. N, no, I can't, Peach laid her head down. You win. I know. I do, don't I? KKKKK. Peach began to cry but Bozette kept laughing and walked past her. Guards. Take her into her bedroom and lock her away. Bozette walked up the stairs and entered the throne room. It was small, enough room to fit only a few dozen people, no more. It was good enough for him. He sashayed over to the throne itself, lined with gold and with red velvet cushions that looked absolutely comfortable. As King Koopsa he would never have even considered such a throne his body too burly, his stature too sizable, his scales too thick. Nothing would have benefited that kind of body more than a throne of iron. As Bozette, though, she sat down, and felt an immense, intense sense of the essence of pence, ah, uh, peace. She spread her legs wide and leaned back, laughing quietly to herself. Queen of the Mushroom Kingdom. Or, Lordess, as she had taken to calling herself. She finally felt a major burst of relief after all these weeks of fighting and beating people up, she wondered if they had any able juice stocked up around here. Welp, here it was. She won. She had taken over the Mushroom Kingdom, just like she planned, now what? Hello. I'm your host, MC Balahu. And I'm here with you live on Balahu tonight with our new guest, the mystical wizard Merlorn. Merlong sat in the chair next to Balahu and tried to make himself look comfortable in front of an audience of millions. Of course, at the moment there were merely cameras, and the audience was small, quiet, not easily laughing so far hello, I'm happy to be here Merlong said how are you adjusting to your new life? Balahu asked. Now that you're the defense minister, you've sure got a lot on your plate, especially with serving your country. The audience clapped and politely cheered with their patriotic fervor. Very polite it's, Mayor Long paused. He loathed himself for taking the job. He knew he wanted to stop Bozette from taking control of the country. He hated her so much, but he took the job to work to keep Mushroom Kingdom safe as much as he could. He knew that she had essentially sidelined him and kept him in a position where he could be of little influence but he had to keep the spirits of a conquered people alive. 
He couldn't just quit. It's going very well. We're making a lot of progress. Gumbos has surrendered his claims over Gumba village and the Shiva City Republican Confederation has submitted to Mushroom Kingdom oversight. The threats in our wake are fading and we will be able to rest easy without fear of destruction. Except for, from their very own dictator that's awesome. Balahu shouted. Gee whiz. Want to go have a party? Why, yeah, that's exactly what I want to do. Merlong was trapped in a world of appeasement. He had to save the people of the Mushroom Kingdom by keeping them content. He had to appease the Lord Esposet by keeping her pleased. And he had to appease his inner conscience telling him everything he was doing was wrong. To accomplish the first two, he had to set aside the third. Merlong and Balahu began dancing on stage to a jiggy tune, and it took all he had to keep from crying. Asterisk Paracari swooped down to Luigi's house and dropped off a letter. Letter for the Marios. Addressed to the Mario household. He saw Luigi and noticed that the man was in his pajamas, hair disheveled and eyes sagging. What a wreck. What a loser. He didn't know of the contents of the letter, of course, as opening letters was against the sacred duty of mailmen across the globe, even if they had bombs or lethal toxins inside. It was a relationship between the sender and the reader, and that was the only thing that mattered. Mailmen were the middlemen the mediums to all of this. Not participants. However, Luigi's expression brightened considerably when he read through the letter. Thanks, Paracari he said softly not a problem. He flew away and wondered what about could have been in that letter, what its contents may have been. If he were in Luigi's position, he would have been a depressed loser himself. If his wife had been kicked past the curvature of the earth and due to his poor fighting abilities, well, that would have been utterly humiliating. But Paracari's fighting days were in the past, anyway. He was getting too old for that shit. So he was just glad that kind of situation would never present itself to him. Asterisk several Coopers sat together at a bar, watching TV as the latest tennis match between Rosalina and Nina, facing off to win the all new Bozet Cup that had been created just a few weeks ago. Rosalina was basically cheating what with her ability to levitate off the ground at all times, but she was still losing to her opponent so far. One of these Coopers was Cooper, a former partner of Mario and currently gulping down his fourth drink of, um, zesty. His friends were rowdy watching the tennis match, but he faced away from them, instead staring at the large portrait of Bozette that was now legally mandated to be placed in a prime location in all restaurants bars, and places of food or drink service. Her image was captured in the midst of laughing, her sharpened fangs showing and heavy amount of cleavage right in the center of the frame. They had all ogled it at first, but now it was clear that it had become an eyesore in an otherwise classy establishment. If Colorado were still around, surely he'd have thought of something to help them out of this jam. But Cooper... He just wasn't strong enough. One of Cooper's friends noticed his door mood and put his hand on his shell. Cooper, what's wrong? What's wrong? We're being ruled by this jerk here and... Well, we had enough of that already, didn't we? Cooper had had a little too much tea to be able to form coherent thoughts at this point. Bozette. Our man one of the other Coopers said. Saw her in person the other day when she spoke in Shroom City. Finest piece of shell I've ever seen. Why's she got that shell anyway, another asked. She part Coopser or something. The other shrugged she's just another. Bowser, or something, Cooper mumbled. Coopser village ain't for that. But tensions between Toads and Coopers had begun running higher ever since Bozette's takeover. Coopers were being more readily recognized for new government positions. Coopsa Village was receiving more financial assistance than Goomba Village even though the latter had just been raised after the Goombos skirmishes. Colorado's wife had gotten a death threat on her answering machine the other day it may suck here one of the Coopers said. But it still beats Bozaland. Never going back to that horrid place. I heard there's been a lot of bloodshed out there these days, with all the Coopalings or whatever. Mushroom Kingdom's way better. But. Then why did Coover go back? Cooper asked, 
starting to cry. Cooper and Coover had gotten so close recently, and then suddenly. He was just going back to the place where everyone's treated like slaves. It was insanity. And he couldn't even stop him. Cooper continued into his fifth drink. And then his sixth. Rosalina ended up winning the tennis match. Asterisk Lumpy and Mustafa sat together under the shade in an unassuming bench in an unassuming part of dry, dry desert. Lumpy hadn't considered that this type of meeting would actually be happening, not in a million years, but it looked like he was finally making it happen. Bozette's wonders never ceased, so, how are things going? Lumpy asked his mousy whiskers twitching as to give Mr. Farron an indication that things were currently okay to divulge the good details we excavated the pyramids and Teuton Koops's grave has a great many wonders, that we can use. Its ancient chain chomp forces are excellent, and so you've given my proposal some thought. Lumpy asked an exclusive, lifetime contract with the Lumpy Oil Conglomerate Association, Limited. For all our energy and water supplies, it's a tough one. But you'll be safe Lumpy added. I can protect the dry dry republic with all means at my disposal. Buzzer protects Mount Rugged, and my oil tankers by the sea, it may seem too aggressive, Mustafa was always waffling back and forth. He was not a true leader. He was a puppet, and that is exactly what Lumpy required him to be for his oil empire to truly succeed. If you secede, they will invade. I doesn't matter if it's Peach or Bozette, they will invade. Lumpy clasped his hands together. You must do what's best for your people. You're right, Lumpy smiled. Then we have a deal. Asterisk Huff and Puff looked down from the clouds, past flower fields, down to the world below. Nimbus land had fallen, and was now an official territory of the Mushroom Kingdom. The royal family had fled and were in exile in Delfino. But, Huff and Puff's territory had remained untouched. A land of plants and nature, a world of beauty and strategic resources, shooting stars were quite powerful. A land of tough puffs and lakitus that reigned free, or as free as Huff and Puff would let them be. And yet, why hadn't the Mushroom Kingdom attacked him? Why wasn't he given the chance for a negotiated surrender giving him asylum and free access to Mushroom Kingdom diplomatic resources so that he could leave this dreadful place and finally get on with his life? It's not like he wanted to be a dictator. It just sort of, happened dot and if they weren't going to take his land over, he couldn't just invade them, or it wouldn't be the same. He wouldn't be making the same mistake as Gumboss. Brighton rest his soul. Why was Nimbus land chosen and not flower fields? It wasn't fair, everything that Bozette woman did, it was too irrational. She was such a poor dictator. Huff and Puff just wished he could, guide her. But it seemed as if that was never going to happen. The weather was beautiful and the fresh air smelled great from up on the balcony. However, Princess Peach, deposed monarch of the Mushroom Kingdom, could not be out there to enjoy it. While the windows were open, they were also barred, and access to the balcony was now forbidden after her third escape attempt. So now there was nothing much for her to do with her life except for wandering around the room, reading the stacks of books on her shelves, and laying in bed staring up at the ceiling. She felt like she was the protagonist of some teen fantasy novel, trapped in a life she didn't want to live in a fate she wanted to escape from because she really just wanted to see her girlfriend who was way more exciting than the boring stuffy aristocratic life she had been through for all these years, and yet she found herself in her bedroom alone more often than not. Not that Peach was literally any of these things, but she sure felt like it sometimes. Maybe she had been reading too many books lately, there were a few knocks on her door, and the guards let two guests in. Normally, visits were strictly supervised but her own handmaidens were certainly allowed to come and go as they pleased. Now, what Bozette didn't know was that these two handmaidens were not actually handmaidens, but plain and simple friends of hers, but it wasn't Peach's fault that Bozette had a hard time telling Toads apart Toadit. Toadico. You're here. Peach exclaimed. She hugged her two favorite girls in the whole world together and squeezed them together. What brings you here today? Well, Toadit began, but she trailed off. 
Todiko nudged her with her shoulder a few times. Oh, well, we do have some good news. Please, do tell Peach said. Being up here in this room all day, not knowing the way the world is turning. Bozette won't even tell me who's visiting on official business anymore, she just slides reports under my door every week. A lot of things are going badly Totoko said. Yoshi's Island is a target for annexation now, and a lot of people are upset about it, oh my. That's the good news. Totoko. Shut up, dude Todit said. The good news is that Mario's coming back. We got a letter from one of his allies, a young man named Jean who has apparently joined Mario's new team. He's going around the world fighting minions and bosses to try to reclaim, ah, uh, something. He wasn't clear. But it means Mario is still out there. As he always was. Mario was always going on these grand adventures, collecting things and meeting a whole lot of new characters, especially girls. Mario loved collecting new girls and their hearts. He certainly was a ladies man and nothing was ever going to change in that regard. He wondered who the new flame was going to be this time. Rekindling his fling with Vivian right in front of Peach was a bit too much for her to take back a few weeks ago, but if everything went all right now, she would be willing to look past all of this. Any of this. She just wanted Mario back I'm really happy for him. I'll be looking forward to when he gets here Peach said, with a hint of envy in her voice. Is that, all? Okay, so, ah, uh, Todit stammered out a non-response and began to blush. Princess, is it okay if I tell you something that might be a bit awkward? Go ahead. Peach stepped back and sat on her bed. I think I might know something about Bozette that will surprise some people. Like that, she isn't who she says she is. The reason she looks so much like you is because I think she's wearing a super crown. A super crown. Peach was aghast. But those are locked securely in the royal treasury. There's no way for anyone to access it except for, well, Toadit's face was as red as Captain Toad's cap. There was one time when I might have, uh, taken one over to Mario's house to, uh, show it to him. Peach realized the implications of Toadit essentially role-playing as Peach herself at Mario's home and decided never to think about this ever again. So what you're saying is that there's one that was just out there? Well, at least one, at least one at Mario's house, and so what, Bozette is Mario trying to pretend to be his own villain? Or someone got their hands on it at some point Todico added and now Bozette has it, Peach considered this. Could this truly be just some random desperate rival using one of the Mushroom Kingdom's own power-ups against it? And for what? It made no sense. Was it some no-name like Tatanga or something who just couldn't muster up the resources necessary to plot a new attack? Who knows? Well, thank you for this new information. If we can figure out who she is, maybe we can Bozette burst into the bedroom, slamming the door open. Peach. The three women in the room jumped. She noticed the toads and pointed towards the door, saying, You two, get out of here. I'm talking to Peach alone. They scurried away, and then Bozette was now alone with Peach. She stood in front of her, hands on her hips with a fiery expression for some time, her tail wagging like a cat about to strike, but she didn't speak. Peach was a bit confused. Bozette, is there something, wrong? Peach asked. Bozette slumped over. Yeah, um, what is it? I... I don't want to do this anymore. I hate being a stupid ruler of a stupid kingdom. Peach was taken aback. Why was she telling her? They barely knew each other, unless underneath the guise of that super crown there was something else. They hadn't directly spoken in weeks. I'm, um, sorry. And I need to admit something to you Bozette said. I'm Bowser. Oh. That's all Peach could say for the moments after Bowser revealed himself to her. Oh. The thing that struck Peach as the most odd about their conversation was just the fact that Bozette looked so weirdly similar to her. 
There were many differences, obvious La Peach had never, and would never under any circumstance wear a shell on her back with spikes, nor a tail, especially not as long as that but their faces, their dresses, their body types, they were nearly identical. Though. Peach was probably exaggerating on the body types part. Bozette was noticeably taller, noticeably, better endowed. Peach was not exactly dainty by any stretch of the imagination, but she certainly wasn't as gifted with such, bodacious, ah, uh, benefits. So it was almost like twins sitting together, side by side on Peach's bed. This was such an unexpected development that Peach had not been able to process it whatsoever, but she had put her arm around Bozette in a consoling move. Bozette was Bowser. She never would have thought of it. How could anyone have, it's just, been so long since I've actually succeeded at anything that I never would have thought. I'd have been so bored by it. Bowser cried out. His voice was the furthest thing apart about the two. While Peach's voice was soft and cute, Bozette's was pitchy and growling. That was the real way to tell the two apart. That, and the fact that Peach wasn't the one breaking down in sobs. Why would you even want to rule the Mushroom Kingdom? Peach asked. You gave up being King Koopsa, didn't you? I didn't want to rule it. I just wanted to conquer it. And, ah, uh, I did. Why didn't you just go to one of those fighting tournaments, then? It's not the same, Bowser rest his head on her shoulder, and the super crown was resting against the back of Peach's head this, this is too weird Peach said. Bowser, can you take that crown off now? Bowser's body tensed up. I. Ah, uh, no, I don't really, want to. How come? I. I like it Bowser said. I like being in a woman's body. It makes me feel, electric. More powerful than my Koopsa body. Humans are so frail and weak, and yet every step I take as Bozette is, Bowser stopped and chuckled what is it? I just realized, I'm closer to you now than any time when we were married he said, we were never actually married. It was always shams and kidnappings. Legally they count. Bowser, actually, at least when I'm like this, can you call me Bozette? It's kind of, weird, when I'm wearing the super crown. You know. I understand, ah, uh, Bozette. So, even if I feel more energetic and powerful than I have in years, I'm still bored, still sad, and defeating Mario didn't even do anything. What's, wrong with me? Am I broken? Ah. Uh, Peach didn't feel like she was qualified to answer this question whatsoever. You're not broken. You just have to figure out what makes you happy and stick to that. No more invading countries and beating people up and taking over governments. But I'm so good at it. I've annexed two provinces of Sarazaland and Princess Daisy hasn't made a single military move against me. How awesome is that? When Peach returned to the throne she was going to have a lot of clean-up duty to accomplish, she was sure of it. But that was for another time. Right now was figuring out what the heck was wrong with Bozette. He ah, uh, she. She just seemed so, sad. Peach had never in all this time facing off against her realized any of this. She spent so much time trying to escape her and fight her and beat her in kart races that she had never really considered, her dot not the woman in front of her, nor the lizard in front of her you're probably a terrible person, but you aren't a bad one Peach said. I hate you and want you to get beaten up, but, you don't deserve to feel the way you do. Ah, uh, Bozette was extremely confused it's. It's complicated, okay. Peach was also extremely confused. She felt pity and anger simultaneously and that was a dangerous combination of emotions yeah, so. I think I'm done with all this evil dictator stuff Bozette said. She took her head off Peach's shoulder and stood up, wiping her dress off as if it had been dirtied by the mud. You're free to go. Or whatever. She was free to leave. No more being trapped in her own bedroom. No more being held captive by this jerk, Peach stood up as well. You know what? Thank you Peach said. And then she need Bozette in the crotch. 
Obviously it wasn't nearly as painful now that Bozette didn't have any man parts to attack, but it still knocked Bozette to the floor for a moment. She stormed out of the room, and the castle, and kept walking in a random direction. It didn't matter if Bozette was feeling the way she was feeling. She had no right to be the absolute jerk she was, and now that Peach was free, she was never going to deal with any of that garbage ever again. Even though she felt bad for her, it was still very complicated. Sigh. Bozette sighed. That's all she ever did these days. She laid down in her throne, feet against one of the armrests and head against the other. He still couldn't believe he was small enough to actually do it, yo, Toadsworth, she yelled out past the throne room. Come over here and get me some more triple pie. If she had access to a pie bazooka, there was not telling the wanton pie-related destruction she would surely be causing right now, but for now eating a bunch of it was good enough. Toadsworth huffed away, doing his master's bidding at any cost but still grumbling while doing so. Bozette didn't even care about this anymore. She didn't want to rule the country and attack a bunch of countries for dumb resources because that's all she ever did when she was King Koopsa, Master of Realms Unknown, the unwise Fury Sage. But it was such an automatic now that she hardly even thought of it when her generals came in the other morning to discuss tactics and she had gotten them to enact a strategy to send a false force to distract in stardust fields while the main army invaded the Beanbian Kingdom by way of Sherbet Land, a no man's land between Shiva City and Hu Hu Mountain. They went through with it completely and Bozette had hardly even thought about it. Whatever. Peach was around but she was refusing to talk to her. Something about how taking her as a captive prisoner for a month was not the right way to treat a woman. Bah, well, man, Bozette had never thought about that kind of thing. Certainly she had never been held captive for any extended period, but she had most certainly held many women captive. Almost entirely women. It was kind of rude, wasn't it, ah? Uh. Now Bozette felt really guilty. Without regard to the pies that would soon come upon her, she got up from the throne and headed downstairs to the garden. Peach was usually there this time of day, feeding the piranha plants, with water, just water. But when she reached the door, it was shut and locked. She knocked on it and didn't get a response. Is there anyone in there, she asked. Hello. Peach. Still no response. She knocked one more time. And I don't want to see you, Bozette. Wait, I want to apologize. Bozette yelled through the door I don't care. Harsh. You'd think Bozette was a bad person or something. Well, she gave it a shot. And now she was going to go back and get a pie, because all the toad guardsmen laid unconscious on the floor, littered around the foyer like someone went to a doll convention and bought way too much on their credit card and for some reason bought the same kind of doll. Standing in front of Bozette were five individuals. Mario, a giant stopwatch, a woman in a white dress, a woman with a pink afro, a man in a fedora, and a giant wooden dude. It's a us. Mario shouted, pointing at Bozette with an accusatory glare. In his other hand he held a giant red and blue orb shaped like a mushroom. Ah, uh, crap. Mario jumped, as he was known to do. He had returned after a long month's journey traveling from a distant continent, collecting the seven mushroom souls scattered across the planet in hopes of delaying its use in sealing ancient evils should they ever arise, and teaming up with the five men and women who were currently behind him. And they stood brave. T. T. The brave time soldier that had fought in the bloody temporal wars and later helped defeat the evil Whiz Peak on Timbers Island. Princess Shokora, the spirit of a long lost. Royalty of a long-lost civilization, brought back to life by the power of friendship. Jamie Thang, a pink afro-wearing disco dancer and all-around groovy gal. Jean, former pro golfer and current master of the swordsman arts and seeker of female love. And finally, Geno, the doll brought to life we all know and love. Together, they could do anything. Bozette responded to Mario's jump predictably. She shot several fireballs into the air and left herself completely defenseless for a deadly geno beam. Attack that pushed her into the staircase at the back of the foyer. Mario landed right next to her, thudding against the ground and meeting her eyes with a determined glare. 
Their eyes took note of each other for just one split second, but in that moment they realized each other's presence. Not just as opponents, but as full-fledged enemies. He threw a punch at her, but she grabbed him by the wrist and flung him over her shoulder and crashing onto the floor behind her. Due to the extremely well-waxed tile he slid another ten feet before coming to a complete stop. Geno followed up his beam with a Geno Whirl, a disc so powerful that, timed correctly, it could cause critical damage with just a graze. He charged up the attack, launched it forward, and Bozette caught it. KKKK. She threw it back, this time at Jamie T, who was currently dancing instead of fighting. It hit her and knocked her out immediately. Jean took out some magic pistols and began firing what appeared to be magic lasers. Mario didn't keep very good track of his allies' abilities this time around, to be honest. Toadsworth, who was entering the vicinity holding a triple pie, freaked out and jumped, the pie flying briefly into the air. Bozette responded by jumping, taking that pie, and launching it into Jean's face. He fell backwards and was disabled for the next several minutes, if not longer. Bozette then took out her chomp shell, which glowed golden and was nearly blinding all by itself. She smashed Geno to the side, and Princess Shokora's mysterious magics were unable to create a shield around herself and she was hit as well. Mario knew this was going to end poorly if they didn't try something desperate, and fast don't you have some cool final blow to end me? Bozette asked. Surely you didn't come all this way without a plan. TT created five time displaced clones of himself, but Bozette shattered three of them in one swing. Here he went, here it is. Mario shouted, holding up the mushroom soul receptacle. The glass mushroom broke open, sending the seven mushroom souls flying around the foyer and circling around Bozette. She was as confused as could be unsure of whether to attack the souls or ignore them and keep clobbering Mario's allies. She tried to do both, sending fireballs on ground level and then jumping into the sky to bash the ethral wisps around her. The bashing was ineffective as mushroom souls were intangible, but one of the fireballs his Geno, setting his wooden doll form on fire instantly. He began running around the foyer in a bright blaze but there was little that could be done for him. Mario had to act before the mushroom souls merged, he jumped in front of another fireball that was about to hit Princess Shokora and deflected it back towards Bozette with his super cape. Since Bozette was still airborne that fireball instead crashed into and destroyed an original family portrait of House Toadstool, but at least Shokora was safe. He looked back at her and she stared at him with eyes of adoration, face aflame with a passionate blush. In turn, he winked, as he was wont to do. It was only appropriate. Bozette landed and wrapped Jean around with her chain, pulling it like a whip and bringing him right up to her. He tried to break free, but the magical golden glow of the chain made it impossible to escape. How do you like my crown, big boy? she asked, her tongue out and sharpened teeth showing prominently. Jean took off his fedora, revealing the sweat covering his forehead and the bald derriere of his head. M, 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 he began. I just want to let you know, that I could never hurt a woman. You may hurt yourselves if you go with the bad boys all the time, but, if you ever need a man who's sensitive and kind you can always look to me be by your side. I'll have you, know I was a pro golfer, and I won a, a, sponsorship from the Orbulan Corporation. Bad boys. Bozette scoffed. Kaka, I don't need bad boys. I can do bad all by myself. Jean gulped. Dot at this moment, what was left of Geno's charred body collapsed onto the floor, the fire mostly extinguished. The entire castle would smell like ash for a week M lady, Jean said don't worry, you will be okay Bozette. I'll treat you like a virgin, touched for the very first time. Jean gulped again, and Bozette opened her mouth to begin charging a massive breath of fire. At the same time, Princess Peach emerged from a side room and entered the foyer, looking on at this scene in relative horror Mario. What are you doing, she shouted we're a here. Mario replied with great enthusiasm. She seemed to realize what was happening and gasped. No, wait, stop this. But at this moment the mushroom souls finally merged together into a large ethral being in the shape of a toad, 
but with human-sized proportions and a cap that was three feet in diameter. It stuck out its cloud-like hand and shot a vicious beam Bozette's way, sending sealing magic into every pore of her body. She would be completely depowered, if the spell worked as the shamans described, and they would have a chance to defeat her for good. It worked. Her chain lost its luster, turning grey and then brown with rust. Jean broke free, but instead of fighting he merely fainted. But then something unexpected happened. The crown on Bozette's head cracked and then fell off. Bozette's form disappeared, morphing and shifting into something else. She grew taller, wider, her eyes glowing brighter, all as if they had unveiled her true form, a much more sinister, evil A. Bowser, Mario did not see this coming. Bowser roared out, a cry of pain and agony and rage, fire bursting out of his mouth as he shouted towards the ceiling. It was powerful enough that it broke off the chandelier, which fell down and crashed into him on the head. He burst out of the self created cage a moment later, but by then TT had created another ten time clones, all of which ran up to Bowser. He took out the sonic symbols he had used only once before, but they, too, were powerless, at least as far as Mario could tell. They weren't even good normal symbols. The T.T.T.C.S. reached him and began beating the ever-loving shit out of him. Please, Bowser cried. Please. Stop, in unison, all of the T.T.S. said only, no and Mario was proud. Holly Koopsa fumbled with her key ring hands shaking as she hurriedly tried to locate her house key and get inside. A car alarm went off behind her and spooked her, but when nobody showed up behind her she was able to regain her composure and find her key. She went inside, and her home was wrecked. Furniture overturned, glass covering the floor, her late husband's shell cracked and ashes spilled out. Spray painted on her TV was a simple message, Coopers get out. Holly couldn't bear to look at it she ran back outside crying. Shroom City wasn't supposed to be like this. This was supposed to be for the bumpkins in the Toadwood Forest, not here. Why, why did they hate her so much, she had no destination, but she kept on running. It was all she could do. Asterisk, and effective immediately, I will depart from the Mushroom Kingdom, never to return Mayor Long said, looking down at the floor. I apologize for any pain I have caused you or your families. It was only my intention to keep the governmental change stable and easy, not, not to hurt any of you. And that's what happened. The crowd was upracious, screams and shouts overflowing and reverberating across the city traitor. Stay here and let us take care of you. Merlong should stand trial with Bowser. They're best buds. Yeah. Justice for the Mushroom Kingdom. Asterisk in a holding cell in an unmarked dungeon in an unmarked castle in an unknown location in Dark Land, Boom Boom sat amongst a dozen other political prisoners, chained up and huddled in whispers. If the Koopa trolls outside heard them, they'd be beaten. But they still spoke. It was their only way of staying sane. He had heard whispers, literally, of what was going on outside. Not outside this building. Per se, it was obvious what was going on in Bowser's kingdom, with the worst succession crisis he'd ever been witness to. The revolution against Morton Koopsa was deadly and it was a half-decade struggle. Boom Boom had seen his own people suffer and his home destroyed, and for a while he never thought it would have an ending except in his own death. But that revolution was a noble cause fought by honorable comrades against a tyrannical evil. This succession struggle was nothing more than a sham. So many dead, so many imprisoned, so much destruction, and it was all for naught, apparently. For those whispers Boom Boom heard, they were that Bowser was alive and well, but captured by the Mushroom Kingdom. Boom Boom looked up at the ceiling and said a little prayer to himself. Wherever you are, Bowser. Boom Boom is looking out for you, buddy. Be strong. Be the king you were meant to be. Boom Boom tried to say that, at least. His voice was too dry to make any sound come out of his throat. Instead, he said it in his mind. And that was enough. They were coming by sea, just like Lumpy had said. A vast armada of dozens of warships and hundreds of smaller boats approached the coast, 
Mr. Fa could see from his telescope. If they reached land, they would surely set a direct path to Dry Dry City, and with their meager militia and the vast desert before them, they could hardly wage an effective guerrilla war. If they made landfall, the Republic was doomed. The main standing in the boat next to him, though, stood tall and proud. He was Jonathan Jones, a captain recommended specifically by Lumpy himself. A proud pirate with decades of experience at sea, he seemed to look down the armada not with fear, but with anticipation they are using pirate guy ships Jonathan said, his sharky fins flapping in the wind. That means they have low priority on this attack. The warships must be skeleton crews, too. You mean they have an army of dry bone soldiers on board? Mr. Fa asked no, I mean never mind. If I am reading this formation right, it appears the Mushroom Kingdom has hired none other than Captain Syrup to lead the charge Jonathan continued. My men have dealt with her before. Admiral Bobbery may be in command, but Captain Syrup is the real leader behind a force like this, surely. She won't be a problem, as long as you have those bonsai bill cannons I asked for. They were provided Mr. Fassett. Provided with a heavy interest loan from the Red Bob Om Army. If they won this war, he had no idea how they would pay for everything they were afforded. They may never be able to, with Dry Dry's meager resources and isolated geography. But freedom tasted too sweet just to give up. They had to fight. Asterisk he must stand trial. Toadsworth said he had control of the Senate and the courts. He's too dangerous to be kept alive said Chancellor Toad. He had more overt control over the judicial process, even if Toadsworth had more direct access to the princess herself, and the Chancellor was going to keep it that way, like some young squirt like Toadsworth was going to steal it all away from him. Bar can't we just, exile him to cool, cool mountain? Toadsworth suggested. Our dissident regions our dissident regions are angry that the Mushroom Kingdom so readily transformed into a warmongering dictatorship just because of a change in leadership. If we show that we are at peace again, they will rejoin. But, Toadsworth tried collecting his words. We have to look fair. We can't appear to be what Bowser already was. The Chancellor was disgusted. But he had to admit that Toadsworth was right in this, if only this. But you know how the trial must end. We can't place Bowser anywhere without considering that he may return. The Mr. Snowmans will riot if we place him anywhere near their territory, after what happened in Sherbet Land. He's already shown he can escape from an island, and he knows the underground tunnels beneath the continent too well. We have to end this while we can. I understand Toadsworth said. But as far as this line of thought goes, Peach has the final word, you know. Toadsworth stood up and began departing from the conference room. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to go inform Prince Mallow about the fate of his parents. Good luck on that the Chancellor said. Peach having the final word, the Chancellor almost laughed. It hadn't been a real monarchy in a decade. It wasn't suddenly going to become one again overnight. He knew who held the real power in the Mushroom Kingdom. Bowser cried. He touched the top of his head, feeling nothing there but the red patch of hair that had always been there, here inside this oversized body to fit his undersized soul. Down forty floors underneath the ground, in this prison from what used to be the Koopsa Brothers' fortress. Those four, those imbeciles. What he'd give to be around them these days, in a life that wasn't filled with utter misery. But they went missing shortly after Mario defeated them in their own hideout. They had apparently fled Bowser's inevitable revenge, abandoning their identities and slipping into a new life in First Letter World. They were probably right to do so. Bowser's temperament back then was unforgiving. But looking back, surely he would have kept them around. They were loyal, crafty, and while they weren't too bright, they were tenacious enough that they would have served him well in other plans. They would probably have been much more successful than the Brudels that's for sure. That didn't happen. Bowser was instead captured and sent to prison, awaiting a trial he knew nothing about, with no visitors and no company. He appeared to the sole prisoner in the entire floor, as if he was so special that they would reserve this honor just for him. 
Bowser clutched at his chest. His thick, muscle-bound chest, hard to the touch and firm like the monster she was. She hated herself. Her time as Bozette had been the best time of his life. Better than overthrowing Morton Koopsa, better than crushing Shizai's rebellion, better than all the parties she ruined, tournaments she crashed, heroes and villains she defeated. Bowser wanted nothing more than to return to that time, but all she could do was sit in this holding cell and continue to cry. He stop it. He. Bowser was no longer Bozette. That time was over. He was done. There was a rattling from the nearby elevator as its rickety chains pulled down a passenger. It was a small pig wearing glasses, and one who seemed to have imbibed substances shortly before arriving. From the way he stumbled towards this cell. Not directly looking Bowser in the eye, the pig spoke. You don't know me, I don't know you, he said. 